Misrepresentation, Wikipedia article audio A concept of English law, a misrepresentation is an untrue or misleading statement of fact made during negotiations by one party to another, the statement then inducing that other party into the contract. The misled party may normally rescind the contract, and sometimes may be awarded damages as well. Representation and Contract Terms No General Duty of Disclosure The Untrue Statement Inducement Fraudulent, Negligent and Innocent Misrepresentation Negligent Misstatement Remedies Rescission Damages Vitiating Factors Bibliography The law of misrepresentation is an amalgam of contract and tort, and its sources are common law, equity, and statute. The common law was amended by the Misrepresentation Act 1967. The general principle of misrepresentation has been adopted by the USA and various Commonwealth countries. A representation is a pre-contractual statement made during negotiations. If a representation has been incorporated into the contract as a term, then the normal remedies for breach of contract apply. Factors that determine whether or not a representation has become a term include Otherwise, an action may lie in misrepresentation, and perhaps in the torts of negligence and deceit also. Although a suit for breach of contract is relatively straightforward, there are advantages in bringing a parallel suit in misrepresentation, because whereas repudiation is available only for breach of condition only, rescission is prima facie available for all misreps, subject to the provisions of S.2 of the Misrepresentation Act 1967, and subject to the inherent limitations of an equitable remedy. There is no general duty of disclosure in English contract law, and one is normally not obliged to say anything. Ordinary contracts do not require good faith as such, and mere compliance with the law is sufficient. However in particular relationships silence may form the basis of an actionable misrepresentation. To amount to a misrepresentation, the statement must be untrue or seriously misleading. A statement which is technically true but which gives a misleading impression is deemed an untrue statement. If a misstatement is made and later the representer finds that it is false, it becomes fraudulent unless the representer updates the other party. If the statement is true at the time, but becomes untrue due to a change in circumstances, the representer must update the original statement. Actionable misrepresentations must be misstatements of fact or law, misstatements of opinion or intention are not deemed statements of fact, but if one party appears to have specialist knowledge of the topic, his opinions may be considered actionable misstatements of fact. For example, False statements made by a seller regarding the quality or nature of the property that the seller has may constitute misrepresentation. Statements of opinion are usually insufficient to amount to a misrepresentation as it would be unreasonable to treat personal opinions as facts, as in Bissett v. Wilkinson exceptions can arise where opinions may be treated as facts. Statements of intention do not constitute misrepresentations should they fail to come to fruition, since the time the statements were made they cannot be deemed either true or false. However, an action can be brought if the intention never actually existed, as in Edgington v. Fitzmaurice. For many years, Statements of law were deemed incapable of amounting to misrepresentations because the law is equally accessible by both parties and is, as much the business of the plaintiff as of to know what the law. This view has changed, 
and it is now accepted that statements of law may be treated as akin to statements of fact. As stated by Lord Denning, the distinction between law and fact is illusory. An action in misrepresentation can only be brought by the misled party, or represent. This means that only those who were an intended recipient of the representation may sue, as in Peak v. Gurney. It is not necessary for the representation to have been be received directly, it is sufficient that the representation was made to another party with the intention that it would become known to a subsequent party and ultimately acted upon by them. However, it is essential that the untruth originates from the defendant. The misled party must show that he relied on the misstatement and was induced into the contract by it. In Apwood v. Small the seller, Small, made false claims about the capabilities of his mines and steelworks. The buyer, Apwood, said he would verify the claims before he bought, and he employed agents who declared that Small's claims were true. The House of Lords held that Apwood could not rescind the contract, as he did not rely on Small but instead relied on his agents. Edgington v. Fitzmaurice confirmed further that a misrepresentation need not be the sole cause of entering a contract, for a remedy to be available, so long as it is an influence. A party induced by a misrepresentation is not obliged to check its veracity. In Redgrave v. Heard Redgrave, an elderly solicitor told Heard, a potential buyer, that the practice earned £300 p.a. Redgrave said Heard could inspect the accounts to check the claim, but Heard did not do so. Later, having signed a contract to join Redgrave as a partner, Heard discovered the practice generated only £200 p.a and the accounts verified this figure. Lord Jessel M.R. held that the contract could be rescinded for misrepresentation, because Redgrave had made a misrepresentation, adding that Heard was entitled to rely on the £300 statement. By contrast, in Leaf v. International Galleries, where a gallery sold painting after wrongly saying it was a constable, Lord Denning held that while there was neither breach of contract nor operative mistake, there was a misrepresentation, but, five years having passed, the buyer's right to rescind had lapsed. This suggests that, having relied on a misrepresentation, the misled party has the onus to discover the truth within a reasonable time. In Doyle v. Olby, a party misled by a fraudulent misrepresentation was deemed not to have affirmed even after more than a year. The common law was amended by the Misrepresentation Act 1967. It was mildly amended by the Unfair Contract Terms Act 1977 and in 2012, but it escaped the attention of the Consolidating Consumer Rights Act 2015. Prior to the Misrepresentation Act 1967, the common law deemed that there were two categories of misrepresentation, fraudulent and innocent. The effect of the Act is primarily to create a new category by dividing innocent misrepresentation into two separate categories, negligent and wholly innocent, and it goes on to state the remedies in respect of each of the three categories. The point of the three categories is that the law recognizes that the defendant may have been blameworthy to a greater or lesser extent, and the relative degrees of blameworthiness lead to differing remedies for the claimant. Once misrepresentation has been proven, it is presumed to be negligent misrepresentation, the default category. It then falls to the claimant to prove that the defendant's culpability was more serious and that the misrepresentation was fraudulent. Conversely, the defendant may try to show that his misrepresentation was innocent. Negligent misstatement is not strictly part of the law of misrepresentation, 
but is a tort based upon the 1964 obiter dicta in Headley Byrne v Heller where the House of Lords found that a negligently made statement could be actionable provided a special relationship existed between the parties. Subsequently in SO Petroleum COLTD v Martin, Lord Denning transported this tort into contract law, stating the rule as If a man, who has or professes to have special knowledge or skill, makes a representation by virtue thereof to another, with the intention of inducing him to enter into a contract with him, he is under a duty to use reasonable care to see that the representation is correct, and that the advice, information, or opinion is reliable. The misled party may normally rescind the contract, and sometimes may be awarded damages as well. A contract vitiated by misrepresentation is voidable and not void ab initio. The misled party may either rescind, or affirm, and continue to be bound. If the claimant chooses to rescind, the contract will still be deemed to have been valid up to the time it was avoided, so any transactions with a third party remains valid, and the third party will retain good title. Rescission can be effected either by informing the representer or by requesting an order from the court. Rescission is an equitable remedy which is not always available. Rescission requires the parties to be restored to their former positions, so if this is not possible, rescission is unavailable. A misled party who, knowing of the misrepresentation, fails to take steps to avoid the contract will be deemed to have affirmed through latches, as in Leaf v International Galleries and the claimant will be stopped from rescinding. The time limit for taking such steps varies depending on the type of misrepresentation. In cases of fraudulent misrepresentation, the time limit runs until when the misrepresentation ought to have been discovered, whereas in innocent misrepresentation, the right to rescission may lapse even before the represent can reasonably be expected to know about it. Sometimes, third-party rights may intervene and render rescission impossible. Say, if A misleads B and contracts to sell a house to him, and B later sells to C, the courts are unlikely to permit rescission as that would unfair impinge upon C. Under Misrepresentations Act 1967 S2 of the Misrepresentation Act 1967, the court has discretion to award damages instead of rescission, if of opinion that it would be equitable to do so, having regard to the nature of the misrepresentation and the loss that would be caused by it if the contract were upheld, as well as to the loss that rescission would cause to the other party. Damages are monetary compensation for loss. In contract and tort, Damages will be awarded if the breach of contract causes foreseeable loss. Given the relative lack of blameworthiness of a non-fraudulent defendant for many years lawyers presumed that for these two categories, damages would be on a contract-slash-tort basis requiring reasonable foreseeability of loss. In 1991, Roiskett Trust Ltd v Rogerson changed all that. The court gave a literal interpretation of S.2. The phrase shall be so liable was read literally to mean liable as in fraudulent misrepresentation. So, under the Misrepresentation Act 1967, damages for negligent misrepresentation are calculated as if the defendant had been fraudulent, even if he has been only negligent. Although this was almost certainly not the intention of Parliament, no changes to the law have been made to address this discrepancy. This is known as the fiction of fraud and also extends to tortious liability. The relative expertise of the parties, the reliance that one party has shown on the statement, the reassurances given by the speaker, the customary norms of the trade in question, the representation forms the basis of a collateral contract. 
agents have a fiduciary relationship with their principal. They must make proper disclosure and must not make secret profits. Statements of Opinion Where an opinion is expressed yet this opinion is not actually held by the representer, where it is implied that the representer has facts on which to base the opinion, where one party should have known facts on which such an opinion would be based. Statements of Law Statement to the misled Negligent misrepresentation is simply the default category. By contrast, a fraudulent misrepresenter is liable in the common law tort of deceit for all direct consequences, whether or not the losses were foreseeable. Mistake, undue influence, duress in English law, duress in American law. S.2 does not specify how damages in lieu should be determined, an interpretation of the statute is up to the courts. Misrepresentation is one of several vitiating factors that can affect the validity of a contract. Other vitiating factors include 